My area of passion since 1999 has been studying high-performing technology organizations. And so this is a journey that started for me back when I was a CTO and founder of Tripwire, where I served for 13 years. And um, uh, you know, our goal was always to understand how did uh, these high performers become great? Right? Uh, so what, did, what was so exemplary about these? They had the best project due date performance in development. They had the best operational stability and reliability. And they all ha also had the best posture of security and compliance. And so our goal was always to understand how do these uh, organizations make their good to great transformation? Why? So that the rest of us could replicate those amazing outcomes. And so uh, one of the most uh, surprising parts of this journey for me over the last 16 years is that it took me straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. Because I think it's a solution to maybe the biggest business uh, challenge of our generation. The last time that we saw an industry this transformed was during the 1980s when uh, manufacturing was transformed through the application of lean principles. And I think that's happening in the work that we do. And that impacts approximately 8 million developers and 8 million technology professionals, operations professionals. And and so even though I, um, I think, most identify with an ops person, I was actually trained as a developer. I got my graduate degree in compiler design. Um, so as your self-appointed ambassador from the DevOps community, what I'd like to do is really share with you uh, my top aha moments you know, in my DevOps journey. Uh, just to set a frame for this, I think I had made the claim that DevOps is urgent and important. And I think the reason is that you know, we saw this downward spiral happening in every technology organization independent of company size, independent of industry vertical, profit, not for profit, left unchecked without something like DevOps would lead to horrendous outcomes, not just for dev, but for tests and operations and information security, and ultimately the organization that we served. And I think one of the major contributing causes for this downward spiral was first coined by Ward Cunningham 11, 12 years ago, and he called it technical debt. Right? And in my mind, technical debt is such a poetic, evocative phrase. In my mind, I visualize it like this. Technical debt is all, uh, um, is, you know, it, technical debt is, in our world, right, is the accumulation of all the crap that we have allowed into the data center, each time made with a promise that we're going to fix it when we have a little bit more time, right? And just because of the way that human nature works and because of the way life that works in general, right, there's never enough time. So uh, every time that we take shortcuts in a project, every time that we don't write automated testing, every time that we manually do a deployment or manually configure an environment, right, we accrue technical debt. And technical debt, like financial debt, gets worse. This, although bad, is not nearly as bad as this. And so these things happen, right? Um, so uh, one instance of a downward spiral is that in the conclusion of a project where we as developers took shortcuts, right, we have one more fragile artifact in production. But there's actually a more insidious downward spiral that happens that's even far more destructive, which is that deployments start taking longer. So think of a friend who's been associated with an application that took five minutes to deploy, so it's taking an hour, so it's taking a day, so it's taking a weekend, so it's taking a week. I've had firsthand experience of an application that supported a $6 billion display ad uh, service that took six weeks to deploy. It involved 1,300 manual, extremely error-prone steps that would tie up three to 400 people across the entire value stream, from dev to test operations, and sometimes even information security. And so when that happens, I think that's what sets the stage for the intertribal warfare that can exist between dev, test, and ops. So here's our friendly developer checking code into the repo at 5 p.m., right? And they'll high-five each other in the parking lot because they made the date and start buying shots at the bar, not realizing that we've set the entire data center on fire, right? And now everybody, including intoxicated developers, must now work all weekend to get the services back running before anyone notices. And so I think uh, left unchecked, uh, you know, this leads to horrendous outcomes. Deployments are taking ever longer. Features are taking forever to get to market. We have an ever-increasing number of several outages happening in production. And everyone feels powerless to change the outcomes. We feel trapped in this never-ending horror movie that with a suspicion that things are actually getting worse over time. Uh, does anyone here have a friend that can resonate with any element of this story? Some of you, right? So the good news is you're not alone. But the better news is we now know there's a better way. And so my first surprise is really uh, the, this learning after having benchmarked over 20,000 organizations that the business value of adopting DevOps patterns is even larger than we thought. I worked with a gentleman named Jez Humble. He's a co-author of the Continuous Delivery book uh, in Lean Enterprise. And we worked with Puppet Labs. And over the last three years, we've benchmarked 20,000 organizations, really trying to seek to understand what does high performance look like and what are the behaviors and the processes and the culture that enable high performance? What we found is that high performers are massively outperforming their non-high performing peers. Um, so as measured by, I'm going to skip these bills, and I think this explains why so many organizations are adopting DevOps. It's not just the unicorns, it's our service providers such as New Relic, it's financial services, it's retailers, it's manufacturers, it's even government agencies. So I think when you ask the question, why are they? It's because the value is even larger than we thought. As measured by what? So, 
we found that high performers are more agile, right? or meaning uh, they get more work done, as measured by they're doing 30 times more frequent deployments. That's deployment of code, say by a developer checking a code into a repo, or that could even be a change in the environment done by someone in dev, test, or operations. Right? And more importantly, they can get into production 200 times faster. In other words, how quickly can they get from code committed into the test cycle, into the deployment cycle, to successfully running in production? High performance can do it in minutes, maybe hours, whereas lower performers will take weeks, months, or even quarters. So furthermore, we know that high performers get far better outcomes when they do a deployment. They're 60 times more likely to succeed without causing a Sev1 outage, a service impairment, a security breach, a compliance failure. And when something does go wrong, they can fix it 168 times faster. In other words, the mean time to restore service is 168 times faster. Right? And so you know, the one big aha moment is that you can be faster and be more reliable at the same time. In fact, as been uh, evidenced throughout the, these two days, is that the only way that you can be this reliable is by doing smaller deployments more frequently. Our common experience has been the larger the size of the deployment, the larger the crater we make in production, and the harder, more difficult it is to fill it in. The other aha moment, however, we found last year was that high performers, they have not only better IT performance, they have better organizational performance. They're twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. And for those high performers that gave us a stock ticker symbol, they, were, they had 50% higher market cap growth over you know, three years, which is, by the way, absurd. Right? It is absurd to think how a developer or how a sysadmin does their daily work could impact the bottom line, let alone be evidenced in stock price. And yet, if we, if we believe increasingly how every organization acquires customers and delivers value to them, then maybe being 200 times faster than our peers will create winners and losers in the marketplace, which I find extremely compelling and exciting. But there's another uh, learning for me that I find so exciting, which is you know, to uh, scrutinize the deploys per day metric. So let's go to Amazon. Back in 2010, actually 2011, sorry, uh, John Jenkins said, you know, they're not doing 10 deploys a day, they're doing 15,000 deploys per day. One deploy every 11.6 seconds, right? And, you know, that's amazing, right? But not as amazing as what Ken Exner said earlier this year. He said, now at Amazon, we're now doing 136,000 deploys per day, right? And by the way, what's a deployment? It could be code committed by a developer silently migrated to the production environment. It could be a configuration change in the environment. It could be uh, you know, a feature going live behind an A-B test, right? That could be you know, thousands of new environments going online, all considered to be one deploy. And the reason why I think this is, uh, the question this brings up is why do high performers have this ever increasing number of deploys per day? You see it at every high performer, Netflix, Etsy, uh, Google, right? And I think the reason is, is that the deploys per day metric is actually hiding an even more important metric, which is deploys per day per developer. In other words, I think what DevOps shows us is under certain conditions, we can actually scale developer productivity linearly with the number of developers. I think generations of us, we've been trained by Frederick Brooks in a mythical man month, right? If you double the size of the development team, you double the integration effort, double the test effort, and ultimately the effort required to get value to the customer. And I think DevOps shows us it doesn't have to be this way. So one of the things that we tested in last year's survey was exactly that. So on the y-axis, we show the deployment frequency, deploys per day, right, uh, logarithmic scale. On the x-axis is the number of developers. And what we found was startling. In the low performers, as developers' numbers went up, deployment frequency went down. In the medium performers, it was constant, whereas in the highest performers, and the high performers, you know, developer um, deploy frequency went up linearly with the number of developers, showing us that we can break the, the mythical man month, which I think is exciting. And there's no technology leader who doesn't care about developer productivity, whether we're dev, test, operations, even information security. So that's my first. By the way, how am I doing here? Am I um, uh, being too cavalier with this claim? Uh, awesome. So theory building, theory testing. I love it. So surprise number two is that DevOps is as good for ops as it is for dev. And I think even to this date, uh, you know, I think one of the most astonishing examples of continuous delivery and how great great can be is the Facebook chat story that happened in 2008. And so some of you may roll your eyes saying it's a chat server, right? That sounds pretty easy. 
but you know, did you know that it was actually one of the largest technical undertakings that Facebook had ever undertaken? It was the largest project team. It was the first of Erlang on the back end. It's an order n cubed algorithm that implemented naively. It took them one year for them to actually ship this functionality to customers. And so how did they use that year? Every day during the course of that year, the chat team would check code into the repo, would get silently migrated into the production environment, invisible to customers, and moreover, they were using, for the vast majority of that year, every Facebook browser user session as a test harness. You know, the, the JavaScript code running on the browser would send invisible test chat messages to the backend services right, you know, to be able to simulate production-like loads. So the result is one year later, when they launched the functionality and released it to everyone, they went from zero users to 70 million users overnight without a hitch. How? They were testing into production-like loads for nearly a year. And by the way, just to share with you where I came from, right, as an ops person, if you had told me five years earlier that testing in production could ever be a good thing, right, I would have, I would have laughed at you. I said, that's crap. Testing in production, I would have said, is what bad developers do to ops people because they hate us, right? They're lazy, they don't care about quality, they don't know how to plan, right? I don't know what they care about, but quality isn't one of them, evidently. If you've seen what I've seen going to production, right, you might conclude the same thing. And yet, what a game changer this is, right? If we can do code deployments in the middle of the day, right, we can synchronize the work hours um, so that dev and ops can work at the same times, right? We don't have to do deployments at Friday at midnight or 1 a.m., just like Camilla was describing yesterday, right? And so lest you think that you can only do this for hippie, open source, you know, easy apps like Facebook, you should know about what CSG did. Scott Prue, he's the chief architect, he described how they're the largest bill printing company in the US. If you get a paper bill from a, uh, a wireless carrier, a cable company, chances are it comes from a, one of their bill printing plants. They did a DevOps transformation for that application, which is a COBOL mainframe app. Oh, and by the way, to deploy new functionality, you also have to touch the 20 technology platforms around it. Right? So this is like architecturally like one of the worst case scenarios. They, they moved to a daily deploy. Right? They were doing daily deploys into a UAT environment. Right? And so what was the result? Mean time to repair dropped by 98%. Incident count went down by 70%. But more importantly, how long did it take to deploy new functionality and complete a deployment? It went from 14 days of people panicking in a war room right, with executives coming in you know, every hour saying, are we done yet? 14 days of that to now they're able to be completed by the end of the first day. Right? And what are the ops people doing? They're playing Xbox right? because it has become so boring and routine. So if you can do it for a COBOL mainframe app, Right, my claim is that you can do this for anything. So to share with you why I think this is important, so important, I love this quote from Nathan Schimmick. Uh, he told me uh, this quote. He said, as a lifelong apps practitioner, I know that we need, to make, we need DevOps to make our work humane. So in the past, I've worked on every holiday, on my birthday, worse yet, on my spouse's birthday, and even on the day my son was born. So some of you may have friends who have been in situations where they've had to do the same thing out of a sense of duty or obligation or maybe because they didn't have a choice. And I think the reason why many of us think DevOps is so important is that it doesn't have to be this way. We know there is a better way. So let me share with you another sort of pattern that I think impacts the development community even more, which uh, this, I first heard Patrick Lightbody um, say this in 2011 at the Velocity Conference. He said, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever. Right? And I love this quote, and it's not like he hates developers, right? On the contrary, he loves developers. It's not like he's waking up random developers at random times. I think what he was putting his finger on is that if you want shared goals that span the dev, test, and operations value stream, we have to have to have some element of shared pain. And so Werner Vogels at Amazon would even say it even more succinctly. He would say, if you built it, if you even helped build it, you must help run it. And I think I am acutely aware that you know, me, jackasses like me, showing slides like this is probably mobilizing an entire generation of developers to hate DevOps, right? You know, they're now out to sabotage any DevOps app, um, efforts because we did not become developers to wear a pager. Pagers are for ops people. The reason they became ops people is because they like pagers, right? And so I think that's a valid narrative and certainly understandable, but I think there is actually a better narrative out there, which comes from Tim Tischler, who very recently he was leading a DevOps initiative at Nike. And he said, as a career-long developer myself, there's never been a more satisfying point in my career than when I got to write the code, uh, when I pushed it into production myself, when I got to see the happy faces of customers when it worked, 
And maybe even more importantly, I could see the angry faces and the shaking fists when it didn't work. Um, and I could fix it myself. Right? I didn't have to open up a ticket. I didn't have to wait a day. I could have not only fixed it faster myself, but more importantly, I could have learned something. Right? So, that it could, you know, so I would be able to prevent it again from happening again in the future. And I think our ability to do this has been diminished over the last 10 years. And I think that's taken a lot of the joy out of development work. And I think it's actually DevOps that brings that joy back. Uh, how am I doing here so far? Does this uh, resonate with you? Right? Right. And by the way, there's never been a safer time to do this right? with things like New Relic. So you know, it's a big aha moment for me uh, is that Dev and Ops were both engineers. You know, I was at the Mountain West Ruby conference in 2013. And uh, there's a, uh, one of the professional services pr uh, people from uh, it was either Puppet or Chef or Ansible Assault. But what was so striking to me was that on the screen, he was working inside of an Eclipse IDE. He was writing Cucumber test scripts to test you know, the correct configuration of the environment. He was talking about test-driven development. Right? I mean, in fact, what I think what struck me so much was that if I had closed my eyes just by listening to him talk, I would have thought he was a developer. Right? He, this guy could have been talking at Java 1 10 years ago. So I think it, it is no doubt in my mind, 10 years from now, Right? All operations people, will you be using sh development tooling, development philosophies, um, because we're all engineers? In fact, one of the most startling points of the uh, state of DevOps reports was the top predictor of performance in terms of a practice or a behavior that predicted IT performance and organizational performance was just one thing. Is ops using version control? <laughs> in fact, whether ops used version control was a higher predictor of performance than whether dev used version control, right? Which is preposterous, right? In other words, um, and so you know, I think that my theory for this is that where are there more configurable settings? Where are there things that can go wrong? You know, um, is it in the environment or in the code? And my genuine belief is that almost in any environment, there are orders of magnitude more configurable settings that can be misconfigured, right? That can cause catastrophic consequences for the organization and the customer, right? And so that's where the entropy is. Then that's what belongs most in version control. So you know, I think that's really exciting. Surprise number three. Uh, the importance of measuring code deployment lead time. There are many things to measure, but I think uh, the main lesson I learned after studying manufacturing and lean principles is uh, the importance of lead time. So even though in the DevOps community, our favorite metric is deploys per day, in the manufacturing community, their most cherished metric is lead time. For nearly 50 years, there's been this deeply held belief that lead time is the most accurate predictor of quality, customer satisfaction, and even employee happiness. And what we found in a benchmarking work that spans 20,000 IT professionals is that lead time uh, has that same sort of powerful predictor in the work that we do as well. And so we would measure lead time not by you know, how quickly can we convert raw materials uh, you know, at one end of the plant to the other. Instead, we would measure it as how quickly can we go from code committed through the testing cycle, through the deployment cycle, to successfully running in production. And so that is, seems to be the most magical measure. And by the way, why there, right? There are many places where you can start the clock, right? Why at code commit? Why not at feature accepted by dev? And I think the reason is that when code is committed, whether it's dev, test, or operations committing the code, right, or the change, that point is actually what divides up the work that the entire technology value streams do, right? So you have the design and development value stream on the left, Right, which is highly creative. Often we do work for the first time, right, never to repeat it again. So it's highly creative. The outcomes are, you know, have high variability. But testing and operations has to be highly mechanistic. We want it to be the same way all the time, and we want it to happen fast. Right? And so this doesn't mean that testing and operations happens after design and development. In fact, with test-driven development, it, it actually happens before development starts. And so lead time simultaneously predicts the effectiveness of both sides. I'm going to try to motivate why. It's because that code deployment lead time is an effectiveness measure of how quickly our, we can get feedback from our automated testing. It is also uh, an indicator of how quickly we can deploy into production without causing chaos and disruption downstream. And when something goes wrong, whether it's because a customer tells us or because we have you know, the things like miraculous capabilities like New Relic, that when we learn about something going wrong, we can detect it and correct it quickly. And the deployment lead time shows how good is DevOps at, at working with each other to not only deploy code from left to right, but also get feedback from right to left. Right? Um, and you know, I think for me, one of the key learnings is the main goal of you know, 
the technology work, right, and anyone supporting developers is to enable developers to get the fastest feedback on their work as possible. Right? In other words, when you deploy only once every six months, it means that the fastest we can, the quickest that we can get uh, feedback on whether we did a good job or a bad job is six months later. Right? And now all sort of traces and evidence of cause and effect are long lost. Right? And now it becomes an archaeology and maybe even a witch hunt. Right? And so you know, that's the goal of the work we do is create the fastest feedback loops to give developers feedback on the quality of the work that they're doing. Um, let me go to, and by the way, if there's one question that you can ask that can predict all of IT performance and organizational performance, right? There's actually one question that you can ask that is startlingly accurate in terms of predicting it, which is, to what degree do we fear doing deployments, right? And specifically on a scale of one to seven. One is we don't fear it at all, we enjoy it, right, as a non-event. Seven is we have existential fear, <laughs> right? Because we know that it is so painful that we don't want to do it more often. How organizations answer that question on a scale of one to seven was a stunning predictor of performance, which I just, I love, right? Um, so surprise number four is that DevOps is not just for the unicorns, right? It's not just for Google and Amazon and New Relic and Etsy and Netflix, right? It's also for the horses. It is for large, complex organizations, you know, who have been around for decades or even over a century, just like Time Inc., right? They've been uh, extant for nearly 100 years. And so that is really my area of passion now, which is how do we understand how DevOps transformations look like in large complex organizations? And that's the reason why I've held a conference for two years called the DevOps Enterprise Summit. And our goal was really to understand, you know, how are they, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? What did they do? What were their outcomes and what are their challenges? And so here are my top surprises out of two years of this conference. The first is the high, the, these organizations are putting into practice the same principles, practices and culture norms that you now see at Google, Amazon, Netflix, and New Relic. Target is doing 10 deploys a day uh, with fewer than 10 instances per month. Uh, Capital One is doing hundreds of deploys per day with a lead time measure not in months but in minutes. Uh, Gary Groover talked about it at Macy's. They were in a situation where they're doing 1,500 manual tests every 10 days to now doing hundreds of thousands of automated tests daily. Um, <laughs> Disney is now embedding nearly 100 operations engineers into the dev teams, into the line of business. Right, uh, you know, so that with shared values, uh, and so they've helped uh, teams across the Disney enterprise. Uh, Raytheon described how they are doing DevOps for uh, ground control for satellites, right, uh, reducing the certification time and test time from months down to a day. Um, yeah, some of these stories are just so amazing, right? So if you can do it for COBOL mainframe apps, if you can do it for ground control stations for satellites, you know, again, my claim is we can do it for anything. The last uh, observation I would make is that these are some of the most heroic journeys I've ever seen in my life. You know, I think um, the reason is that the people uh, who are driving these transformations, go back one slide, uh, are, I think we're all given some degree of air cover, but they are, I think, w almost in every case, widely exceeding the air cover they were given. You know, essentially putting themselves into some element of personal jeopardy. So why would they do this? And I think it's because all of them shared, now they're spanning almost 50 speakers over two years, they shared a sense of clarity and conviction that the capabilities they were delivering to their organization were needed by their organization. Not to even win in the marketplace, but to even survive in the marketplace. And I think you heard that as we heard from Time, Capital One, and so forth. And I think you know, that is uh, an amazing historic journey to do this in an organization where they've been in it perhaps had decades or even a century of command and control management styles, low trust, right? For them to do that is, uh, I think, an incredibly uh, heroic tale. So why do I think this is important? I think it's important because left unchecked without something like DevOps leads to horrendous outcomes, regardless of what industry we're operating in, regardless of how big we are, whether we're profit or not profit, you know, left unchecked without something like DevOps leads to horrendous outcomes. And I think DevOps not only brings us, makes us more productive, but also brings joy back into the work that we do. Uh, so with that, uh, let me conclude by uh, saying that if any of you want a free copy of the Phoenix Project, uh, thanks to New Relic, um, at, there's a uh, meetup happening at 2 p.m. at the Vanderbilt Room outside the sponsor hall. And if you're interested in getting copies of the slide, um, if you want links to all the videos and slides from DevOps Enterprise 2014 and 2015, if you want um, the first half of the Phoenix project for free in PDF form, if you want uh, 
drafts of the upcoming DevOps handbook, which is uh, nearing complete, all you have to do is send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com, subject line DevOps. And so don't take a picture, just send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com, subject line DevOps, and you'll get an automated response uh, you know, within a minute or two. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Jacob, thank you so much, and, and hopefully I'll see you at 2 p.m. <laughs>